thank you everybody for coming. Um, and thank you, Jenny, for, for being here. Uh, I first met Jenny in a, in a very New York kind of way. Uh, we were both guests at a monthly Anthropocene salon being held in a huge, beautiful, art-filled apartment just off Union Square. It was the kind of scene where artists and philosophers and writers eat banana bread and drink tea and while away the afternoon, earnestly discussing the fate of the planet. I hadn't uh, met Jenny Offal before, and though I'd heard about her much lauded second novel, uh, Department of Speculation, I hadn't read it. Uh, but she said she was working on a climate change book, which was why she was there that day, and I was curious. Uh, then I read Department of Speculation, and I was, I couldn't wait, uh, because Department of Speculation is an amazing novel of ideas and of infidelity and marriage and astronomy and parenthood and consciousness. And I won't belabor it now, but suffice it to say, I was, I was deeply eager to see what this phenomenal, deeply philosophical writer was going to do with the problem of climate change. That was several years ago in the before times, uh, but I hadn't forgotten. And so it was with great anticipation that I saw her new novel, Weather, finally slated to come out in February, 2020. I was delighted to see it get rave reviews, especially in places where people don't often spend much time talking about climate change. And I read it myself with enthusiasm. And then of course, uh, the last half of uh, Jenny's book tour got canceled uh, and the New York was on lockdown. And pretty soon we were all turning to face a different horsemen of the apocalypse. Now, to say I was blown away by the novel would be mistaken if it made you think of an explosion, but not wrong if, it, if what came to mind were dandelion seeds or leaves or clouds. Weather is the rare kind of book that weaves and unweaves itself at the same time, building its familiar fictional world of New York circa 2016 in which Lizzie, our intrepid feral librarian, is doing her level best to take care of everyone around her, while on every page pulling the, at the loose threads that threaten to unravel the whole thing, particularly the threads of climate change, catastrophic anthropogenic global warming, ecological and civilizational collapse, near-term near human extinction, doom, 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 doom. What seems especially and poignantly unraveling, unraveling about the book is its deep commitment to compassion and human dignity in the face of ungraspable planetary upheaval. It's also pretty funny in a wry and gentle way. And the more time I spend with the book, the more this humor too seems like an act of compassion from the author herself toward the reader, protecting them from the unassuageable sorrow climate change seems to promise. The form of the novel, it should be said, does essential aesthetic work in this wise, both connecting by juxtaposition seemingly unconnected things, for instance, a child's board game and climate change driven crop failure, or a dog's chew toy and the contradictions of consumer middle class environmental consciousness, and disorganizing in a very controlled manner the narrative, characterological, and social conventions of the contemporary novel. Jenny Offel's work has been compared to that of Renata Adler, Lydia Davis, and Robert Walser, and she herself cites Don DeLillo, Octavia Butler, and her friend Lydia Millet uh, as influences on this book, and all that makes sense. But the novel I couldn't help thinking of while rereading Weather was George Eliot's Middlemarch, and not because of any similarity in style, but rather because of a comparable kind of attention and compassion. There's a sense in Middlemarch that every nobody in the village is granted their full human dignity through the combined attention of Dorothea Brooke and the author herself. There's a sense of cohesion and connection that comes into being precisely through this kind of work, maybe something like what Hegel calls spirit. Jenny Offel and her compatriot Lizzie do the same kind of work in weather, creating an impact far larger than the novel's slim 200 pages would suggest. There's an emblematic moment very early in the book on the first page, in fact, uh, when we meet the doomed adjunct who has been writing his dissertation for 11 years on a philosopher Lizzie's never heard of. She gives him reams of copy paper, binder clips and pens and witnesses both his failure and the dignity of his attempt. The philosopher he's studying is quote, minor but instrumental, he tells her, minor but instrumental. If we had a keen vision and feeling of all ordinary human life, George Eliot writes, it would be like hearing the grass grow and the squirrel's heartbeat. 
and we should die of that roar which lies on the other side of silence. As it is, the quickest of us walk about well wadded with stupidity. That's George Eliot. Jenny Offal has that keen vision and feeling and has given it harrowing form in her novel, Weather. Jenny Offal is the author of the novels, Last Things, Department of Speculation and Weather, uh, which she'll be reading from today, I believe, uh, as well as some wonderful children's books that my three-year-old highly recommends. According to Wikipedia, uh, Jenny grew up all over, including Indiana, which I just verified uh, before, uh, before we let everyone in, got her bachelor's degree at UNC Chapel Hill and was a Stegner fellow at uh, Stanford. She currently teaches at Bard College and lives in upstate New York, where she may or may not be preparing her doomsday. Please join me in welcoming Jenny Offal. Thank you so much. Um, wow, what a lovely introduction. And um, I should say that the, the place where we first met, I, I think of it in retrospect as the apocalypse tea party. It was the first time I'd ever been to this. And actually the reason that I went to it was I somehow heard that Roy was gonna be the guest. And I, was, um, I had read his book, Learning to Die in Anthropocene and I was teaching it. Um, in the MFA program at Syracuse to um, an appreciative and also um, slightly stunned audience of, of grad students. Um, it was in a class called The Unhinged Narrator and uh, everything else was fiction. And this book uh, just felt like it fit in perfectly. So anyway, so pleased to get to be here and, um, and talk to uh, everyone at Notre Dame. Um, my Indiana, uh, history is a little distant, but I still feel like it's always feels so useful to me as a writer to have lived in different parts of the country and not necessarily feel like, oh, I only feel at home here or I only feel at home there. Um, I get sometimes that uh, when I'm here, people say I have a Southern accent. When I'm in the South, people say I have a Northern accent. Uh, when I first moved to the South, they said I had a Midwestern accent. So within that mishmash um, of moving around a lot, I, I became interested in, in what it would be like to kind of um, distill particular moments and images. I think that was partly because of having a somewhat nomadic life as, as a kid and a teenager. And then with weather, um, I was, incredibly scared to try to write um, a novel about climate change as part of what was gonna be in it. Not because I don't think that there have been good novels written about it, but I didn't, uh, I just didn't know how to approach the scope of it. Um, and I ended up deciding to kind of follow how it had been in my own life, which is for a long time, I would only look at it out of the corner of my eye. And so part of the book is about what happens when you start looking more directly at the thing that you're afraid of, which as it turns out is, um, you know, is something you find in lots of stories of mythology and lots of, um, lots of different folk tales is the idea that you at first can't look directly at something. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna read to you a little from the beginning and then, um, and then I'm gonna skip a little bit later in. Um, I actually was going to read the part about the doom dash, but maybe now you guys, um, well, we'll see. It's, it's pretty quick, but, um, I myself was, uh, and continue to be, uh, an adjunct for many, many years. And, um, there's a scene later on in the book where, uh, the doomed adjunct is talking about how, um, he keeps not having a classroom. He keeps being told to go somewhere with his class and then they get there and it's locked and they have to call security, which is something that happened to me. Uh, oh, I feel like it's probably happened to me about 30 times as an adjunct. And it's very tricky at the beginning of a semester because you're trying to have just a wee bit of authority, but you're all just standing in the hallway. And, and then he goes on to say that as the rest of his life has become more bewildering, and unnerving. He's now gotten used to that part of it, the adjuncting. So this begins in the library, um, an academic library. Um, and this is just people come, who come from the community and also from the university um, into Lizzie, the librarian's path. 
Actually, I'm going to read the very, uh, the epigraph too, because one of the things that I sometimes like to talk about with students is um, my incredibly unproductive way of writing, which is that I often read an entire book to get one little tidbit. And this came from a very lengthy and somewhat boring history of the Puritans, but I found this in it. This is the epigraph. Notes from a town meeting in Milford, Connecticut, 1640. Voted that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Voted that the earth is given to the saints voted that we are the saints. In the morning, the one who is mostly enlightened comes in. There are stages and she is in the second to last, she thinks. This stage can be described only by a Japanese word, bucket of black paint, it means. I spend some time pulling books for the doomed adjunct. He's been working on his dissertation for 11 years. I give him reams of copy paper, binder clips, and pens. He is writing about a philosopher I have never heard of. He is minor, but instrumental, he told me. Minor, but instrumental. But last night, his wife put a piece of paper on the fridge. Is what you're doing right now making money, it said. The man in the shabby suit does not want his library fines lowered. He is pleased to contribute to our institution. The blonde girl whose nails are bitten to a quick stops by after lunch and leaves with a purse full of toilet paper. I brave a theory about vaccinations and another about late capitalism. Do you ever wish you were 30 again? Asked the lonely heart engineer. No, never, I say. I tell him that old joke about going backward. We don't serve time travelers here. A time traveler walks into the bar. On the way home, I pass the lady who sells whirling things. Sometimes when the students are really stoned, they'll buy them. No takers today, she tells me. I pick out one for my son, Eli. It's blue and white, but blurs to blue in the wind. Don't forget quarters, I remember. At the bodega, Mohan gives me a roll of them. I admire his new cat, but he tells me it just wandered in. He will keep it though, because his wife no longer loves him. I wish you were a real shrink, my husband says. Then we'd be rich. My brother's late, and this after I took a car service, so I wouldn't be. When I finally spot Henry, he's drenched, no coat, no umbrella. He stops at the corner, gives change to the woman in the trash bag poncho. My brother told me once that he missed drugs because they made the world stop calling to him. Fair enough, I said. We were at the supermarket. All around us, things tried to announce their true nature, but their radiance was faint and fainter still beneath the terrible music. I try to get him warmed up quickly, soup, coffee. He looks good, I think, clear-eyed. The waitress makes a new pot, flirts with him. People used to stop my mother on the street. What a waste, they'd say. Eyelashes like that on a boy. So now we have extra bread. I eat three pieces while my brother tells me a story about his Narcotics Anonymous meeting. A woman stood up and started ranting about antidepressants. What upset her most was that people were not disposing of them properly. They tested worms in the city sewer and found they contained high concentrations of Paxil and Prozac. When birds ate these worms, they stayed closer to home, made more elaborate nests, but appeared unmotivated to mate. But were they happier, I asked him? Do they get more done in a given day? The window in our bedroom is open. You can see the moon if you lean out and crane your neck. The Greeks thought it was the only heavenly object similar to earth. Plants and animals 15 times stronger than our own inhabited it. My son comes in to show me something. 
It looks like a pack of gum, but it's really a trick. When you try to take a piece, a metal spring snaps down on your finger. It hurts more than you think, he warns me. Ow. I tell him to look out the window. That's a waxing crescent, Eli says. He knows as much now about the moon as he ever will, I suspect. At his old school, they taught him a song to remember all its phases. Sometimes he'll sing it for us at dinner, but only if we do not request it. The moon will be fine, I think. No one's worrying about the moon. The woman with the bullhorn at the school door is there this morning. She's warning the parents not to go in, to leave the children there behind the red line. Safety first, she yells, safety first. But sometimes Eli cries if he's left alone in that loud scrum of people. He doesn't like having to walk alone from one side of that huge cafeteria to the other. Once he froze in the middle until some aide grabbed him by the elbow and pushed him towards his corner. So today we make a run for it and dart past to his assigned assembly point. His friend is at the table and has animal crackers, so I make it out of there without tears, but not before the bullhorn lady yells at me, no parents, no parents may accompany their children. God, she loves that bullhorn. Something shoots through my body at the sound of her voice, then I'm out on the street again, telling myself not to think. I'm not allowed to think about how big this school is or how small he is. I've made that mistake before after other drop-offs. I should be used to it by now, but sometimes I get spooked all over again. All day long at the library, cranky professors. I swear, the ones with tenure are the crankiest. They will cut past other people in line to check out a book or set up their hold list. Studies have shown that 94% of college professors think they do above average work. They gave us a guide the other day, tips for dealing with problem patrons. The professors weren't mentioned. There were the following categories, malodorous, humming, laughing, defacing, laundering, combative, chattering, lonely, coughing, but how to categorize this elderly gentleman who keeps asking me to give him the password for his own email. I try to explain that it is not possible for me to know this, that only he knows this, but he just shakes his head in that indignant way that means, what kind of help desk is this? There's a poster of Sylvia at the bus stop. It says she's coming to give a talk on campus. Years ago, I was her grad student, but then I gave up on it. She used to check in on me sometimes to see if I was still squandering my promise. The answer was always yes. Finally, she pulled some strings to get me this job, even though I don't have a proper degree for it. On the way home, I listened to her new podcast. This episode is called The Center Cannot Hold. They could all be called that. But Sylvia's voice is almost worth the uptick in dread. It's soothing to me, even though she talks only of the invisible horseman galloping towards us. There are recognizable patterns of ascent and decline, but our industrial civilization is so vast, it has such reach. I look out the window, something in the distance, limping toward the trees. The door opens and my son hurls himself at me. I help him peel some rubber cement off his hands. Then he goes back to his game. This is the one that everyone likes. It is a 3D procedurally generated world, according to my husband. It's fun to watch them play. They put together buildings block by block then fill the rooms with minerals that they have mined with pickaxes they have made. They assemble green fields and raise chickens to eat. I killed one, Eli yells. It's almost night, Ben tells him. There are bills and supermarket flyers, also a magazine addressed to a former tenant. The cover promises tips for helping depressive people. What 
to say, I'm sorry that you're in so much pain. I'm not going to leave you. I'm going to take care of myself. So you don't need to worry that your pain might hurt me. What not to say. Have you tried chamomile tea? I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit here to um, the moment where she goes to see her former uh, mentor, uh, Sylvia, who's now become a podcast host and is speaking at the college. Um, and this is a few weeks later. Um, and it's an interesting point in the book because I just think of it as, as when um, that looking out of the corner of the eye starts to uh, change a little bit. I don't know what to do about this car service man. He told me business is down, no one is calling anymore. He had to let all his drivers go and is down to one car. He sleeps at work now, so as never to miss a call. His wife has said she's going to leave him. Mr. Jimmy, that's the name on the card he gave me. I try to use only his service now, not the better, faster one. Sometimes when I call, his voice is groggy. He says always that he will be there in seven minutes, but it is much longer now. I used to take a car service only if I was going to be late, but now I find I am building in double the amount of travel time. A bus would be the same or faster. Also, I could afford it. But what if I'm the only customer he has left? I'm late for Sylvia's lecture now, and I'm wrong about which building it was in. By the time I get there, Sylvia is almost through speaking. There's a big crowd. Behind her, a graph shaped like a hockey stick. What it means to be a good person, a moral person, is calculated differently in times of crisis than in ordinary circumstances, she says. She pulls up a slide of people having a picnic by a lake. Blue skies, green trees, white people. Suppose you go with your friends to the park to have a picnic. This act is, of course, morally neutral. But if you witness a group of children drowning in the lake and you continue to eat and chat, you have become monstrous. The moderator makes a gesture to show that it is time to wrap up. A line of men is forming behind the microphone. I have both a question and a comment, they say. A young woman stands up to wait in line. I watch as she inches forward. Finally, she makes it to the front to ask her question. How do you maintain your optimism? I can't get to Sylvia afterward. There are too many people. I walk to the subway, trying to think about the world. Young person worry. What if nothing I do matters? old person worry. What if everything I do does? Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks. I'm gonna start clapping. <laughs> <laughs> the clap. Uh, <laughs> um, wow, uh, it's so great to hear it too. Uh, um, there's so many there's so many different voices in the novel um, and it's so uh, wonderful to hear, hear it in yours, right? Or the, your reading voice anyway, yeah, to hear your, um, your presentation of it, um, and the care with which you, you break down the, the sentences. Um, so we've got time for, for Q and A conversation, um, comments and questions. <laughs> Um, um, <laughs> I love the comments. I love the questions. <laughs> if you want to uh, just raise your hand in the uh, uh, using the reactions, uh, people in the audience, raise your hand using the reactions. There's we've got one. Um, I've got questions too. I can hold mine uh, since we've we've got one here. Um, and uh, um, but yeah, so let's uh, Naima. <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you so much for your reading. Thank you for being here um, virtually. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about the fragmented form of the novel, um, which I'm really drawn to. Um, I was listening to a podcast interview that you gave for uh, Literary Friction about a year ago. I think it was like April, 2020. 
Um, and you called it, your, your writing style here, kind of a magpie way of writing where you kind of collect things that seem shiny to you and then like build a nest around them, which I really, I really like. And I wanted to ask you if you could talk a little bit about kind of your process of organizing um, and arranging the fragments in the book, kind of um, like, did you begin clustering the fragments kind of early on or did you like gather without kind of imposing an order and then see what happened? And then what did the nest building process look like once you did begin kind of imposing an order on these kind of collected fragments? Hmm. Um, well, good question. Um, I think the, the sort of magpie part of it, um, the things that I collect, especially the um, the sort of facts that end up in the book or the, the things that come from other disciplines, um, those have a sort of element of chance to them in that I come across them and for some reason they speak to me. Um, they, they seem, it, it's interesting because often they're sort of buried um, in either like technical jargon or sometimes it's like, uh, you know, a very scholarly text. Um, but I, I am slightly mystical about it because they do feel like certain things um, just they they feel like they are radiant and and I'm interested in them and so I take those and I keep those I don't know how I'm going to use them and then at the same time um, I am just doing I guess a more traditional fiction writing process where I'm taking things from my own experience from eavesdropping from friends um, and I'm I'm assembling a kind of you know, it's such a weird thing being a writer because instead of living your life, you know, you're you're constantly like thinking, uh, oh, is that going to go in a, what should I do with that? What, what, what detail am I noticing? And so that's happening at the same time. And then I, I kind of wait and see how they float back in. So, um, you know, at the time my husband was reading books about the pre-Socratics and I was, I think I came across that that fact about the um, the the about the moon and and what the Greeks said about it. And I just I was already thinking about how I was becoming more and more interested in the natural world while ironically sitting in a small room <laughs> and never going out into it. And so um, so I, I began to put those two things together. And then the process of how they are the kind of alchemy part of it. Um, that unfortunately just takes time um, because things just, I lose interest in them. They no longer seem as, um, it's, it's a, a version of that thing where you write something and you think it's good. And then the next day you go and you're like, that was not good. So a lot of it doesn't stay. Um, but then the things that do, um, I just keep trying to see where they will go. And uh, when they're in the right place, I stop revising them. And I'm a very uh, kind of obsessive reviser as I go along. So for me to stop revising something usually means that it's found uh, more or less the right place. Uh, Steve, I see you have your actual hand. Up. <laughs> An actual hand. <laughs> I can count those too, but I may not notice it. <laughs> okay. I was actually at wondering something similar to it, Naima. Uh, just ask, and that that you know, having to do with the form of it, and it, it, as as you know, it's like the form of a narrative contains within it kind of like uh, you know an epistemology or an ontology, and um, and you know with this weather and also Department of Speculation, um, that sort of idea seems to uh, emerge out of these pieces and. Um, it's hard for me to imagine <laughs> these as kind of like the, a traditionally plotted sort of story, which, you know, has this kind of cause and effect relationship between the parts that yours, you know, doesn't, you know, it is, it is more, you know, to me, it is more like a kind of an emergent idea. And I, I'm just, I guess I'm curious as if um, you thought about that <laughs> as part, you know, just telling it as a kind of more traditionally plotted sort of story, or, um, you know, are you um, consciously working with that idea of, um, you know, the story emerging out of these pieces or, you know, just. Yeah. I mean, I, I really, I, I like that idea of something being emergent um, because I feel sort of like um, I want to be surprised too. 
Um, I mean, there's lots of people that write fiction and plot is a really huge organizer for them. Um, and sometimes those are the people that have outlines and have you know a, a totally different process than I do. Um, but I'm just, I'm not like that because um, it takes a long time to know what I, what I think about something. Um, <laughs> during the pandemic, people were sometimes asking if I would write uh, something about the pandemic. And I, I was thinking to myself like, no, I'm, I'm just absolutely like living it right now. I don't even have uh, enough distance to, to even begin to, to say um, what, it, what it felt like at the moment. And so I guess the emergent um, quality for me is sort of something that's always happened with writing is that I, I learn what I think by trying to um, rigorously put it into um, sentences and paragraphs. And, um, and before that, it feels more like a, um, it, it's more like a emotional tone you know, or I, I know that I want to, I, which I think, you know, it's funny because sometimes if I talk to like a musician, that will be more like the way they are about starting a, a song. Um, but it is somewhat of a weird way to write longer form things, I think, because there's a lot of moments halfway through a novel where I think to myself, this doesn't make any sense to anyone but me. And um, with weather, for the first time, I showed it to someone. <laughs> at a halfway point I usually wait really later and it was exactly that it was a very dear friend of mine who's a very good reader and she had to like give me the bad news that it didn't make sense outside of my head uh later I I I gave her a card that said thank you for telling me my book was bad <laughs> because <laughs> I thought it was it was kind of a gift but at the time it was awful um <laughs> and uh you know it took a th three more years for it to really emerge and and be uh narrative in 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 the way that i i hope it to be yeah can, can, can i just ask like a more prosaic question too like uh you know I'm, I'm wondering like during that three-year period when you're revising um you know it's a very you know i imagine it's a very different kind of process than like somebody who's working on drafts of uh you know, and I guess I'm thinking of like, you know, some of these authors like David Markson, for example, also writes in fragments like that. And he used to write by having a, a shoe box with each piece on a note. Yeah, I remember then, hearing that detail about him. Yeah. And yeah. then shuff, shuffling them. So I guess, you know, it's like rewriting for you kind of a matter of. Yeah. Um, I mean, sometimes it's it, it gets less that way the farther I am into a book because certain doors close. Right. You know, you, you have committed to some things. And so in the beginning, though, it is very much a process of. Um, I mean, I feel like the joke I sort of make about it is that it's like if you were doing a jigsaw puzzle, but you didn't have the cover and you had no idea what the jigsaw puzzle actually was, but you could tell when things fit. <laughs> you could tell when they went together. Um, and so, yeah, for for me. The, the one good thing about the way that I work, uh, which is mostly a hair tearing out kind of way to work, um, is that I don't actually have to do a ton at the end. It's more that I can't go forward <laughs> until I've like, you know, re redone something or rethought something. So, um, you know, that was the, the part that I showed to my friend was like 30 or 40 pages. Uh, and I, I don't think I've ever done that before and I certainly won't ever again, <laughs> but, but it was also useful. You know? Thank you. Um, thanks. And there's, uh, we've got a question from Austin. Hi. Hey, uh, thanks again so much for coming to read with us. Um, I was really curious about your decision to end the book with uh, obligatory note of hope.com. Mm -hmm. I'm really interested in like, writers who, who put something at the end of their book that kind of gestures out into the world. Like I think Helen DeWitt at the end of her book is like, if you like this, please give me money. You know, I, <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. That's yeah, what every book yeah, at the end. Yeah. And it just, I don't know. I'm interested in that way of like very like flatly breaking the form, like not even hybridly, but just like sending you mm -hmm. out of the book afterwards. Mm -hmm. So I was curious about your decision. Like what made you want to do that? When did you decide that? Also like Maybe this isn't as much about writing, but like through your research for this book, kind of where you've landed on your thoughts about the crisis, besides, you know, all of our 
overwhelming anxiety about it and yeah you know like what you think of the sunrise movement that kind of thing mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um well I guess the reason I ended up um I mean the end of the book the end of the novel is the last line of it um and I wanted for anyone who wanted to stay there to just stay there um I do think that there is a uh, almost uh, the the sort of compulsive quality of how you have to end on a, a note of hope with the with the climate crisis which is increasingly um <laughs> i don't know it starts to feel increasingly irresponsible um i also find that um people younger than me my students my daughter uh they they don't they have a hope that is much more um just much more nuanced, you know. It's it's a it's a it still understands the incredible darkness of of what the facts tell you, and so for me, I did actually end up feeling a little bit less doomy by the end of the novel, and so I I wanted a jumping off place. It was a little of a like middle of the night idea, so I don't know if I went back if I would do it again. But I especially was interested in things that I found kind of in um there's a part of the obligatory note of hope the tips for trying times that was i was just very taken with like what people had done in other you know just times where everything seemed lost and i have to say that one of the reasons i i mean the reason it's called obligatory note of hope is just the joke of like how people because you've seen that in articles where just suddenly at the end it's almost like someone the hand of god came in and was like cue the music you know um and uh but i did think sort of like the pandemic um in some ways made me happy that i'd done that because one of the things i think is often missing from discussions in climate is like a sense of humility of we how we actually do not know we do not know everything that is going to happen i did not think that there that and the, a lot of the things that if you're a psychological or emotional or physical prepper for climate change, a lot of those things were not useful <laughs> during the pandemic. They did not, uh, maybe emotional prepping was useful, but all the others were not. So I feel like, um, I do feel like the search for the one solution is, is doomed and I have no hope about it. But the search for things like the sunrise movement and just basically the fact that anger and sadness have been allowed into the conversation um, makes me feel more like something could happen because I think people are moved by emotion. If facts were going to move them, uh, you know, that would have happened a long time ago for a lot of people. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Thank you so much. Thanks. Um, other questions? Uh, um, yeah, Katie. And then, and then Patrick. Hi. So something I really enjoyed about your book was the bits of humor and sarcasm in it. Um, and I was wondering if that was intentional for handling a topic that's as heavy as climate change and the anxieties that come along with it, or if that's just part of your writing process and how you found like humor can come into conversation about climate change. Um, yeah, it was, I mean, it was very intentional because uh, there are a few exceptions, but I have not read many things. Uh, many novels that uh, are dealing with um, the climate crisis that are funny, I would say the default is um, is often quite earnest, you know, um, for good reason. You know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's, it, it's, it's, it makes sense that that is what, um, that when you're approaching this, that's, that would be the stance that you would take would be a more solemn one. But I've always, I mean, I've always thought that it was really interesting how if you know somebody who's like an EMT or something, you know, they often have like a really dark sense of humor. And that's because they are in their everyday life constantly coming up against what most of us try not to think about. Um, and uh, I, I have just always kind of had that personality where I feel calmer, if I imagine uh, things that as they might collapse instead of like telling myself that something won't happen. Um, 
it turns out, you know, not to be magic. Like maybe I thought <laughs> when I was 20, that if I always imagined the worst, most depressive thing, uh, somehow that was protective. But, um, but for me, uh, humor and funny people are, are one of the things that just make me still want to get up every day. And often um, I feel like things that are, dark comedy is often like very uh, soothing because it reminds us of, of, of a sense of like community and shared feeling. So, so yeah, I thought as much as possible to put that in, but I was also very aware that if it went in wrong, it would be insensitive, you know? So I, I did, uh, that's why most of the humor is kind of self-deprecating um, in the book, because I feel like I, I didn't, I didn't really want to make fun she makes a little bit of fun of some of the, the climate, um, you know, workshops and things she goes to, but, um, but mostly it's about her own, uh, you know, difference between her sense of herself and how she really is. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And, uh, Patrick McCarthy, you had a question. Uh, yeah, I just like to ask, um, Obviously, the novel's written from the perspective of Lizzie, and that's in a first-person perspective. Um, but obviously, the climate crisis affects so many different people. Um, so I was just wondering, as a writer, how do you go about that challenge of giving the climate crisis in a book from a first-person perspective the same kind of weight to, that shows it's a glo it affects people on a global scale when you're working from this singular perspective? Mm hmm. Um, well, I mean, I think the honest answer is I don't know if I do. I mean, I'm certainly attempting that. And um, uh, I've certainly never been compared to George Eliot before, and I am uh, will be eternally uh, grateful to Roy for that. But I really do like that idea of what does it mean to they, they used to say about the, the monk Thomas Merton that he was um, permanently curious. And I do feel like the, the empathy and understanding of people who are not just like you, but who live very different lives, it does come you know, actually from a place of curiosity of thinking that you don't necessarily um, know, that, that maybe the way that you are rooted um, in your perspective is not is not the only way and it's not and and living in a city I lived in in New York for for very many years and um and that's one of the great things about it is just that you know you can walk out your door and um and you immediately just you can have a very casual conversation with someone that is um you know might might just tell you something that you don't know about the part of the world that they're from versus like your own little tiny place so i think that's why i wanted to set it in a city and that's why i wanted to as much as possible bring in voices of the community while still having it be first person so i guess that was kind of the way i i i thought to address that question of like why does it matter to hear this one you know middle-aged like white ladies view of the climate crisis. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Patrick. Um, other questions? Other hands out there waiting, just waiting to be raised? Um, I can I can ask one while uh, folks, folks think. Uh, one of the things that, so um, one of the classes I assigned your novel for uh, this semester was uh, introduction to to environmental humanities, and we're sort of we spent a lot of time talking about what nature is, um, and and so it was interesting. Then and then we talked about climate change, whatever. But then we it's interesting to come at, at this particular novel with within that framework, right? And, it, and within this discussion of climate change, informed by the the long history of human ideas of our relationship with with nature, whatever that is. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things a lot of the students noticed was that there's there's actually not very much nature in weather. Um, yeah. And I was wondering, there are a couple specific instances and some different things, but I was wondering if you could talk about that, um, how that came into your decision-making process and, and, uh, and so yeah. on. Yeah, 
Um, I, I thought a lot about that um, because I, there's like a, a moment kind of early on where there's a fly buzzing around the room and, um, and she's just noticing it buzz around and then she captures it with a cup and then she lets it fly out the window and she thinks about the fly for a moment about like what it, does it feel joy, you know, the way that it's spiraling around. Um, and, and there's all these other tiny little um, moments, like she's sitting on a bench outside the library and, and she notices, because she's very much a person that notices people, um, which is what I am. I, uh, I, I am so focused on sort of what I, the emotional weather around me that it can often be that I don't eat, notice my physical surroundings very much. Um, and so I wanted her to be that kind of person because I felt like it was more, I just felt like I hadn't seen necessarily that often um, a character in a book that dealt with climate or questions about you know, nature as it were, um, that wasn't already someone who, I love to hike, I love to this. Um, I have sort of a, an odd background because until I was, mm, actually until we moved to Indiana, um, my parents were boarding school teachers and we lived on these campuses where I just had free run. And I absolutely spent like all my time, you know, in the woods or on a mesa in California or whatever. And until that point in my life, I was very, uh, I was just incredibly interested in it. <laughs> and then and then we moved somewhere where I just lived in a more suburban place and, um, and it kind of, it started to fade from my life. And so I guess with, uh, with, with this character, what I was thinking about was like, she starts noticing such small things, even if it's like an apple. And now they're saying that we might not have apples. Um, and then I wanted the end of the book to take place in the country with sounds that she can't tell if they're uh, human or, or natural sounds. Um, so I wanted it to be like incremental almost like that, that the world is coming in, you know, that it's, she lives in her head and the world doesn't come in that much. And then the world is starting to be the world, um, for lack of a better way to say it. Yeah. Yeah. Like the, like the walnuts, right? At the yeah. end, mm -hmm. are mm -hmm. they rifle shots or are they walnuts? Yeah. 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 Right. Right. Yeah, no, it sounds exactly. I live somewhere where walnuts fall on my roof all the time, and they sound exactly like someone's shooting. They're they're hunters also in our woods, so I've lived uh, uh, you know somewhere pretty rural for a long time now. So I've become I can name a couple wildflowers and birds now, but um, but I'm still no no naturalist, you know, uh, as much as I might wish to be. Yeah, in a in a way, it made me think of. Um, you know, the, the David Wallace Wells, uh, the New York, uh, New York magazine piece, The Uninhabitable Earth, that then became a book, right? And, and he was very sort of upfront about like, not having an interest in nature, mm -hmm. you know, per se. Um, yeah, I was just wondering, I guess if that- um, Well, that was, that was very funny when that piece came out because yeah. first of all, I had some of the same uh, like little facts that I had yeah. in my novel because they're they're facts that attract people that um, are not necessarily only focusing on the wonky part or the science part. So yeah. I promptly took those out. But I also, I noticed that he, um, what he was interested in was the epicness of it and the apocalyptic, you know, it, in some ways it felt very like the equivalent of the great American novel, but like climate had finally, and I think that's a little bit of a one of the reasons that I deliberately made the novel kind of small and in a domestic world is that I feel like there's a way in which that epic narrative is how we got here. <laughs> you know, that, that it's always this idea of dominion of like first, even the idea that we ruined the world, you know, and now we must save it. <laughs> It really is completely about humans as some species that are above and beyond all the other, um, you know, creatures that live on this earth. Um, so I think there, I, I'm just struggling in my own life with trying to figure out responsibility 
Um, and also like not buying that sort of voiceover <laughs> narrative too, that maybe it's gonna be smaller things that save the world and not like one article in New York Magazine. I don't know. <laughs> right. yeah. um, On the other hand, I totally read that book and liked it very much, so. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it's, I think there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of great information there. And I, I you know, I'm, I'm sympathetic as, uh, an unhinged narrator myself and, uh, you know, uh, having been called a doomer, although I don't think that's, that's accurate. Like I, you know, I'm very sympathetic to the, to the argument that we need to look at the worst case scenarios. Yeah. Like we don't necessarily need to like, we, it's, it's incorrect and it's incorrect and irresponsible to say that that's what's going to happen, but right. it's really incorrect and irresponsible to say that's not going to happen. Definitely not going to happen. Yeah. Right. It's, like we're somewhere in the middle in this in this place of unknowing, right? Which right. is mm -hmm. which is exactly where you exactly where you put us with with Lizzie. Um, well, as you know, fun fun fact for yeah. Notre Dame people. Um, when I was very beginning, at the very beginning of this novel, I had a working title, and the the working title was "Learning to Die," <laughs> from the exact uh, same you know place that you you right. used it from because I was like that's what we're doing we're in a hospice we're learning to die and then I saw your book came out and uh I was like ah. um but but then I was also like this is perfect title for this book and I think I think my book's gonna have a different title and that happens a lot you know that you when something happens over years but but that idea you know I think yeah of like that there's actually been hundreds and hundreds of years of people studying this question of what does it mean uh, in yeah. terms of philosophy to think about, to think about death, to think about, um, and to think about what we don't know, you know, it's always. Yeah. Important. Yeah. And how do we live in relation to these things? Yeah. And what's like, what's the ethical way to do it? Like, and how do we live together? Right. How do we live together? Yeah. And, and because it's, um, it does feel like, I mean, I also get called a doomer and I feel like um, to me, like being a complete doomer is just a flip side of, of not paying any attention to it. Like, I feel like there's, you know, there's gotta be room for more nuance in the conversation. And in my opinion, the, the youth movements about climate are having conversations that have more of this, um, you know, gray area to them, but. You know, I read that article where they're all like eating fast food on the way to go to like a climate conference where they're actually like ch truly changing like policy. And I thought, well, that's really interesting because like nobody I knew who was an environmentalist in the early days, that would have been like, you're off the island, you know? Right, um, right. The first thing you had to do was like, commit. so you were pure. Yeah. And that's why I never got into it, to be honest, because I'm, I'm just too much of a hypocrite. Yeah, there's the line. Um... Lizzie has that line, environmentalists are so dreary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I, I guess uh, a sort of, oh, there's another hand. Uh, I have more questions, but uh, let me turn it over to Naima. Or not Naima. Hi, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm Mary. Um, Mary. So tonight was my first exposure to your work, Jenny. Uh, thank you so much. And I was struck when Roy mentioned in your introduction that DeLillo was one of your influences because I have read White Noise a few times and something that I always loved about it was the kind of presence of unresolved factoids and percentages. And I noticed some of that in your reading yeah. tonight, like especially the, the worms being tested in the sewer and we get this unresolved question of, you know, are they happier? Um, and I was wondering when you're writing a novel and, and addressing something, a, a topic like this that has so many unresolved questions, how you navigate the tension between constructing a narrative that doesn't leave us feeling like we have too many unanswered questions and, you know, one that, that kind of like strikes that balance without being overly doomer or overly positive. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I, I was just curious about that. Yeah, I mean, I think... Um... I construct that by the time I'm finished writing a novel, um, I feel like I have gone as far as I can go in understanding this particular like moment that I'm trying to write about. Um, I mean, and so it isn't unanswered exactly for me, at least the, some questions are just gonna be unanswered, but in terms of like, 
like I know sort of uh, a little bit who this character would be after the book. I know that there's, I, I think now like quite faint uh, 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 hints about her becoming um, a, a more openly radical person. Um, at the end, there's a sort of, um, you know, a long time in the climate movement, there, there's been this tension, you know, for a long time, it was like about an individual action. And then it was like, wait, we have to think more about collective action and about systemic things. And I think, um, I think at the end of the novel, she's starting to think about that. Um, and, and when I wrote the novel, it was very weird because I've never written anything that was set in the future, but I was writing about the 20, uh, 20 election without knowing, you know, about a year and a half before it happened. Um, but, you know, as I became a little bit calmer about the climate do me, I got so, I became so much of a fascism doomer. Then I ruined dinner parties with my, like, you must read this book and this book. And, you know, do you know what's happening? <laughs> do you know about QAnon? And do you know about disinformation and all this kind of stuff? Um, so I think that, uh, yeah, in in terms of like trying to figure out, but by the end of it, um, it feels like it has a shape, and 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 um, and that's sort of what you're trying to do with form is is contain, and and so I I can sometimes I write the end of a book and I know it's the end and I move it to the end because I just feel like and and so that was what happened there. I wrote that and I thought no, that's that's the end. And then I always have a big like sentence. It's like many things happen, <laughs> like trying to bridge till I get to there. Actually, not that many things. Few things happen. Thank you. Uh, so we're 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 at time now. Um, it, would you? Can I ask just one more question? Do you I'm have... happy. I'm, no, no, no rush. If you would, I'm like just. That. Um, you know, it's such an incredible, so the book, the book um, is set uh, during the, the 2016 election. Um, it's sort of happening in the, in, you know, mostly in the background, um, mm -hmm. but it's sort of there. Mm -hmm. um, but then it comes out, it came out last February mm -hmm. uh, and it's in paperback now. And, you know, you mentioned like, you know, you couldn't have predicted, uh, you know, coronavirus. I mean, very few, you know, a few people were like talking about pandemics and whatnot, but like, yeah, I didn't, you know, I hadn't in my thoughts about, you know, civilizational collapse and blah, blah, blah. Like, <laughs> Wasn't you know, that the plague, plagues and diseases were out there somewhere, but I hadn't like thought about what it would really look like or, you know, how it could happen. Um, yeah, but so I just, I guess I'm just wondering, this is a sort of like reception or like, you know, what's it like? And it's such a strange thing once, once your book comes out, right? Then it's like this other, mm -hmm. has this whole other life, right? Mm -hmm. it's like, um, and so I just wanted to ask like, what's, what's been your experience or, or how have you seen the book moving in the world now as the world changes, right? Around, around the book, right? Uh, yeah. We still, we, we still like climate change is, is just as bad of a, you know, it's not like we yeah. solved climate change and the books become oh. irrelevant. Um, it's, you know, the crisis continues to emerge um, and, and emerge and emerge. Um, but how, you know, how do you see the book moving into the world and what sort of like bounce back or feedback or response have you gotten? Um, well, it kind of came in phases because my book did come out uh, and I, I went on a couple weeks of book tour um, before the pandemic. Um, and, and then I, that was like in late February. And then it was very much, the questions were very much about climate. And, um, and it was, it was really interesting because it just sp spanned all kinds of questions, like people that were actively working about it, people that had said, I, I had this dread and I wasn't sure, you know, what to do with it. Um, and then the pandemic, <laughs> I do remember a couple months into the pandemic, which for me has been very much, um, you know, it was just 
we work pretty locked down as much as possible. And we have people in the extended family very at risk. So, so much of it was just everybody trying to stay alive and help in whatever way you could. But I do remember one night falling asleep and just like seriously, just like vibrating with the tension of like thinking through everything that I, and then I was just like, oh, oh, how weird. I'm not thinking about the climate. I'm not thinking about the climate because it was during the complete lockdown when, when like people weren't like, you know, and I was like, wow, this is, I mean, kind of good to, really to have a break, a tiny break from that. Um, so, and then, then it became all about the pandemic because a lot of the book, a lot of the novel has the disaster psychology stuff in it and um, about how people react to a crisis and, and how people in the very early days, there was so much of that normalcy bias where people just kept thinking it couldn't possibly be what the experts were saying it was, which feels quite similar to climate in that way. And so then I talked about that in most of my interviews. And then um, I was lucky enough that the book is, is being published in some other countries. And that was right before the election. Then everyone wanted to talk about Trump and the fascism stuff. And then I had a few after the um, insurrection. <laughs> it was all just like, what is going on in your country? So it went through these like different phases. And, you know, I was happy that the, the novel in any way was like a springboard to go in, in, in so many different directions. Um, but, uh, but I'm also like, uh, obviously not an expert at any of those, any of those things. So like most writers, in some ways, I'm uh, happiest to talk about how I made, made it. Or, or what I what went into making it and and um, and the sort of craft stuff. So, yeah, in some ways, it, it's going back to that now. Well, I I was thinking about asking you uh, to explain what's going on in this country, but <laughs> no, I, I have uh, ideas. <laughs> <laughs> maybe next time uh, <laughs> with your next book. Um, uh, but I do want to say thank you so much uh, for coming and. Uh, for talking with us and for reading uh, from your wonderful book. I'll, I'll hold it up, although I've taken the jacket off, so you, it just looks like a book. It looks like it has bullet holes in it, so it's easy, easy to... Yeah, I, I like that. Um, <laughs> um, um, well, thank you so much yeah. for having me. It's such a pleasure, and thank you for your great questions. And um, yeah, I hope to hope to come in person to Notre Dame sometimes. Well, I would love to. Let's yeah. do that. So, um, yeah. And so I'll just have a big round of, uh, you know, digital applause uh, for, <laughs> thank you. Uh, for Jenny Offal and uh, a great thank you. And, you know, hopefully we'll see you before it all. We'll see you again before it all. <laughs> before, okay. <laughs> see you before the collapse. <laughs> bye bye. Bye.